we have Professor Ling Li uh, from West Lake University. Uh, Professor Li graduated from Tsinghua University with a bachelor's degree of engineering and uh, his PhD uh, received from University of uh, Western uh, Australia. He held various um, academic positions at uh, Deakin University, University of uh, Edinburgh, and the University of Queensland before joining Westlake uh, University as a chair professor of environmental hydrology in 2018. Uh, professor Lee's principal research interests lie in mathematical modeling of complex environmental systems across different scales. His research addresses fundamental aspects of uh, ocean land interactions and has contributed to understanding the coastal groundwater dependent systems and associated flow and mass transport processes. Uh, he has led more than 20 large scientific research projects and published uh, over 250 research papers in international journals. He is currently as a co-editor of the journal uh, water science and engineering, and he also serves as a member of editorial board of uh, uh, Ad advances in water resources. Uh, today, the title of his talk is Coastal Groundwater Dynamics uh, from Tidal Weave Propagation to Flow Insta uh, Instability. Okay, Professor Li, uh, time is yours now. Thank you, Professor Shui, for your invitations and kind introduction just now. Let me just uh, share my screen first. Um. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. How about now? Oh, okay. Good. Okay, I'll get a laser point, point on. Okay, that's good. Um, now, <clears throat> um, I don't normally have an um, ellipsis um, mark in, in the title of my talk, but um, this time, um, it is an exception. So when Professor Shui asked for the title of the talk, um, I sent it in in quite a bit rush um, and not 100% sure how I'm going to present my work and students' work um, to a community of colleagues, uh, many I know. Uh, many I know with uh, very diverse research backgrounds and expertise and, and interests. So um, I put those three um, dots there to give me um, flexibility. And I did um, spending, uh, spend time to, uh, to organize um, uh, the work in a way that um, I'll take you through um, our research work aiming to explore um, some of these aspects of the complexities of coastal groundwater systems. Um, <clears throat> so I, I hope that doing so, um, the connections of um, some of our work with a focus on the physical processes um, and your research which may um, aim to um, address uh, either the biogeochemistry or the carbon cycles involved um, in some of these uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems. In terms of dimensionality, um, I'm gonna show you how um, a 1D approach um, could answer uh, questions concerning uh, oceanic oscillations at the boundaries, um, how they may propagate uh, in the aquifers. Um, but of course, we know um, the system is not uniform 
in the vertical directions. Uh, this is from um, this is a knowledge we had uh, from the classical saltwater intrusion problems driven solely by the density gradients uh, we know. Um, the salinity profile um, is non-uniform, and of course uh, there is a circulation driven uh, by the gradient um, induced by um, in, induced uh, so by the density gradients um, associated with um, the salinity contrast. So uh, 2D has um, uh, has to be um, in our considerations um, in terms of understanding of the behaviors of the systems and of course the, the subsequent con um, um, qualifications. Now, our initial interest um, is perhaps with water, especially how this underground um, passage may provide um, a way um, for the ground water discharge or discharge of terrestrial water to the oceans um, and how that may play a role in the global hydrological cycles. But of course, um, you know, here we're talking about land ocean interactions and the salinity contrast between sea waters and fresh groundwater um, has played a role. Um, and, and of course, this again is a knowledge we know from the classical problems of seawater intrusions. But I'll show you the density contrast is not only because of the salinity um, differences between uh, fresh groundwaters and seawaters. Uh, we, we observe um, temperature differences between these two waters um, along the coastlines. Um, and that could also induce um, density gradients uh, to drive the flows. Um, the complications, uh, as I will show you, um, leads to um, interesting flow phenomena. But more importantly, the temperature variation itself could impact on the biogeochemical reactions in uh, the coastal uh, aquifers, especially near the shore. Now, the interest goes beyond those physical quantities and processes. Um, when I show you how um, a shallow groundwater systems may be connected and impact on plants, um, and, and you'll see how active that system um, in terms of these uh, eco-hydrological interactions. And, and essentially, you know, the complexity has a lot to do with processes, of course, right? But these are processes that take place at different temporal and spatial scales. So, um, you know, from the first um, cases, uh, the first case studies, um, which I show you uh, propagations um, of oceanic uh, oscillations, um, you see how um, these waves, um, propagate and affected by various factors. Um, but then um, it's not simply just oscillations at the specific frequencies. They are time averaging, uh, time average effects. Um, and, and, and those effects um, could, could change the regional um, scale flow systems. And, and I'll give you an example of that. So um, hopefully um, in the talk, you will see um, how these different aspects uh, may combine to um, produce very complex um, behaviors of coastal groundwater systems. Now, this is a photo taken by um, Claire Robertson's um, a, a very nice uh, photos. Um, and of course, a very familiar um, sin um, for most of us. Um, I, I tell you, uh, most beaches um, in Australia um, are like this. Um, so it's almost very tempting <laughs> to do research work um, at these sites. <clears throat> Many of us, uh, of course, uh, probably go to um, uh, beaches uh, because of the wave uh, shown here. 
Um, the other oceanic oscillation, the tide, um, can be as important, even though not quite um, visible so, uh, in these photos. Anyways, um, if you go to um, the beach, of course, um, this setting um, is, is so, um, it's so um, visible and, and impressive. Um, uh, but of course, you also realize under the beach, um, there's a, a poor water uh, systems and further inland, we might even encounter uh, fresh water. So there is a coastal aquifer here with fresh water input um, and discharge um, to the ocean eventually. But how, you know, the very um, dynamic coastal boundary conditions may influence the groundwater system. This question, um, even though um, very obvious, but has been largely overlooked. Um, and of course, uh, the, the first question we, we would ask could be um, um, how these oscillation propagate inland. Um, and I'm going to show you um, some of the data from a site in um, Scotland um, and <clears throat> the animations. Sorry, I'm 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 still struggling with my um, um, post uh, cover infection symptoms. I haven't had a clear voice for a while. Um, <clears throat> so um, the animation show how um, the water table fluctuated over um, one and a half spring and neap cycle. And if you look very closely, you can see um, relatively frequent oscillations. Well, when I say frequent, the frequency is, um, is over the period of um, 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 days uh, or half a day. So we're looking at semi-dinal um, fluctuations here. But you also see gradually the water table rises and falls over a longer period, um, a spring, uh, the spring and neap cycles, roughly 14.76 um, uh, days. The other thing you um, you notice um, if you if you watch this animation very carefully is that relatively speaking, this high frequency oscillations. Um, um, decades rather quickly as it propagate inland. So if you compare um, the oscillations um, near the shore, if I have the pointer, uh, you can see here near the shore, right? We see um, both spring and neap oscillations and semi-dino oscillations um, quite uh, visible. Um, but further inland, um, this um, semi-dino oscillations uh, very much uh, diminished, uh, but we could still see um, the oscillation rising and falling of the water tables over this spring and neap cycle. Now, before um, our observations, um, uh, Robin Hamers um, and, and her colleague actually um, um, already um, observed uh, the behaviors of um, these water table fluctuations um, in terms of, um, you know, um, how uh, the water tables um, oscillate over the um, semidinal cycles, but also this uh, longer spring and neap period. Um, and, and, uh, and also um, uh, the long period oscillations um, pro propagate much further inland, um, relatively speaking. Now, <clears throat> it's not obvious that water table um, can propagate, um, well, can oscillate, sorry, um, over the spring and neap cycle. Um, 
spring leaf tie is a biochromatic um, um, forcing conditions. Um, there are only two frequencies um, uh, in, the, in the signals. Um, so um, this solar, um, semi-diagonal solar tide and also semi-diagonal lunar tide um, with slightly um, uh, different frequencies. Um, the solar tide has a period of uh, 12 hours and uh, the lunar tide has a period of 12.42 uh, hours. So um, the, the combination of the two, of course, will generate an, ever, an envelope um, with um, the tidal range um, varying over um, a period of 14.76 um, days. This is uh, the spring and leap cycle we're talking about. Um, but if, if, if these two um, oscillations uh, namely S2 and M2, propagate without interactions um, as predicted by, for example, this uh, model is based on uh, a linearized uh, Pusnaski equations um, with the fixed boundaries um, as, as shown here. Um, a simple solution is given here. Um, and of course, uh, that solution predicts also a biochromatic um, water table fluctuations um, with, with the wave numbers and decay ray given uh, for each frequency by this equation here. Um, so how does that biochromatic uh, water table fluctuation looks like? It's shown here, right? So you will see very um, similarly, the variations of um, the range of the fluctuations. Now we're talking about um, groundwater table fluctuations, okay? So you see similar variations of the amplitude or the range of uh, fluctuations over a cycle of the uh, spring and leap period, okay? 14.76 days. And you also see the damping um, and phase shift as well as um, the oscillations of both frequency uh, propagate inland. But there isn't a, um, a long period oscillation as shown um, in the observations um, in the data um, um, plotted here. Um, and there isn't um, um, you know, uh, a third frequency, long period oscillations that could propagate further inland. Um, so um, clearly this models and the mechanisms for the wave propagations um, uh, from, the classical, uh, from the classical theories is inadequate for um, explaining this observed phenomenon. And <clears throat> we looked at how the moving boundary conditions could induce interactions uh, between these two um, oscillations, S2 and M2, as they propagate inland. Um, um, the problem is, to, is, is given here. And of course, be, because of the uh, sloping beach, um, the tidal oscillation produce a shoreline that goes up and down, but also horizontally, um, it, it, uh, it moves across the intertidal zone. Now, um, the, the problem is, is, is now very different from um, the previous um, um, mathematical models um, with vertical um, um, boundaries. Um, and it's not that easy to actually um, solve this problem with a moving boundary condition as such. Um, but what you could do is to introduce a moving coordinate systems as um, defined here by Z. As you can see, essentially, we move with um, the shoreline horizontally uh, as it goes, as the tide rises and falls. And that could transform 
this moving boundary condition to a fixed boundary conditions. Uh, but the complication now is with the governing equations um, uh, having an extra term, um, in fact, a, a long linear term as well. Um, and that complications um, prevented us from uh, deriving a simple um, in, uh, closed form analytical solutions. But this problem can be tackled um, uh, using a perturbation method. Uh, and indeed, we, we did that. Um, and you could see some the expansions here um, with respect to um, this uh, small perturbation variable, which essentially represent um, the tidal amplitudes, um, the ratio of that to um, the, the size of um, um, the tidal excursions or the horizontal extent of the intertidal zone. So with the expansions and uh, the very standard procedures, um, this problem could, um, could be solved. And you can see in D, um, the, um, the moving boundary conditions um, and of course the, the transformed uh, uh, problems with the long linear term in the governing equations introduce interactions between these two uh, primary um, oscillations, M2 and S2. So here um, they are indicated uh, by omega one and omega two. So we see the usual um, generations of subharmonics, uh, two omega one and two omega two, uh, and omega one plus omega two. Uh, these are subharmonics. Um, um, well, by definition, so they are uh, higher frequencies, uh, um, oscillations. But also, um, we see the generations of a superharmonics, um, omega one minus omega two. And of course, in terms of period, this is going to give you the cycle of spring and knee. Um, and I want to draw quickly your attention to some of these constant term now, okay? These are the terms um, which will lead to the over height of the water table above the mean sea level. I'll come back to talk about this tidal over height as the time average effect of the propagations of oceanic oscillations, tide in particular. But for now, let's look at this spring and neap um, oscillations. Um, this is the water table oscillation. As you can see here, indeed, um, there will be um, this long period oscillation generated because of the moving boundary conditions effect and the long linear effect as we see right in the in the transformed governing equations and also um, what you can see here is the the wave numbers and also the damping rate given by kappa four is going to be considerably lower than uh, kappa one, kappa two, or uh, kappa two omega one, kappa two omega two. Of course, even um, um, uh, lower than uh, you know the, the wave numbers or damping rate of these uh, subharmonics. So um, the predictions, you know, then as shown here. Um, um, are very, very, uh, are very much consistent with observed um, uh, groundwater table fluctuations that occur over the semidiagonal cycles, as you can see here near the shore. Um, and um, of course, uh, that high frequency, relatively high frequency oscillations um, gets damped uh, rather quickly. Um, over the distant inland. Um, but the longer period oscillation, which um, is also in present here, as you can see, uh, propagate much, much further um, inland. So um, we basically uh, developed a theory uh, to explain the observed um, uh, long period 
um, oscillations over the spring and NEEP cycle, and also the behaviors as well in terms of the propagation um, distance and also the phase uh, change. Now, um, I kind of said um, semi um frequency is high, but that's only high um, in comparison with the spring and NEEP cycles. Um, an extremely high frequency oscillation also um, at you know presence uh, um, at the coast, and that is uh, um, these uh, surface water waves, as um, shown in that photos. Um, so um, this is an extreme conditions. Uh, this is an extreme conditions, especially because. Um, if we look at um, how the classical theory predict the damping ray quickly increases uh, with um, the frequency of the oscillations. Um, you put in some numbers into this equation here, and then you quickly realize um, at the frequency of surface water wave uh, in the orders of tens of seconds, right? Um, the damping is going to be so significant that we won't observe any um, water table fluctuations um, resulting from the propagation of wave actions. Um, uh, even wave run up um, wouldn't produce um, uh, any visible uh, response in the water tables um, inland. However, um, you know, I, I managed to, found, uh, to find some data uh, um, from um, Waddle, I, I, I think I, that's still the um, researcher's name. Um, I still remember that that's the, um, the, the name of the researchers. Um, um, and, and his measurements show a very visible um, response of water, uh, poor water pressures, um, whether it's water table or now uh, or, or not, um, it's, it's, it's still a question, but clearly um, the pressure transducers show um, responses of um, the water head um, uh, to this wave event. So what's plot here is swash, the swash measures not necessarily in terms of the shoreline movement. Uh, this is likely um, a, um, a, a um, transducers um, um, measurements of um, water pressures um, away from the shoreline. Um, but in terms of the water table fluctuation, what we can see here um, is first of all, it does fluctuate. Um, it responds to these high frequency events. And also as as you know um, as as it propagates, let me still use that word propagate um, inland because these two lines showing um, the signals um, close to the shoreline and this is a bit further away. Now you can see there is no phase shift. Um, these high frequency water table fluctuations um, look like standing waves. Um, and that's also quite interesting. As I said, uh, first of all, um, the fluctuations shouldn't be there as, as, um, as uh, predicted by the classical theory. Um, and secondly, um, you know, there's no phase shift. These are standing waves. That's also very puzzling. Um, so to explain um, these observations, we develop a theories um, that incorporate the effect of unsaturated flow on the water table dynamics. You know, in the groundwater system, we call a water table, right? we, we have a water table, but that's not an interface between um, water, um, saturated zone and no water zone. Above the water table, which is actually uh, given by 
um, zero pressure. It's a, it's a, it's a phreatic surface, right? There's still uh, a lot of water above it. Um, there's an unsaturated zone, but the saturations um, could be still considerably high near the water table. Um, there's a capillary fringe. Um, so um, that unsaturated zone can influence the water table dynamics by incorporating that effect into the governing equations. Now we see um, changes um, in the wave propagation properties in terms of the damping rate and the wave numbers. Now these are, you know, uh, very classical uh, wave dispersion relationship, which we can easily de derive by solving um, the wave equations here. But of course, uh, with the modifications, um, uh, with this term, additional terms, um, the, the dispersion, the wave dispersion relationship um, change. And a change um, in a way that seems to be very consistent with the observations. So let's look at how um, in the limit, um, we may have um, a finite uh, damping ray instead of this, um, um, you know, uh, well, uh, at the limit, the classical theory predict um, an, in, uh, an infinite, uh, in, uh, infinitely large damping rate, okay? So um, this is very different. Uh, this kappa is given by the classical theory, uh, but kappa one here is predicted by a modified um, uh, Bosnowski equations. Um, uh, that's the damping ray, uh, which allow propagation of, um, of, of these high frequency um, oscillations. And then kappa two, representing um, the phase shift, as you can see, as the high frequencies, um, as the frequency increases, it approaches zero. So um, it predict a standing wave. So uh, both properties, um, you know, um, are very consistent with the field observations. Of course, um, we're not just talking about fluctuations here. I already um, indicate that there are time average effect involved. Um, and indeed, if you run a simple uh, simulation based on um, Busnaski equations here, uh, because um, with solving the equation numerically, we could easily deal with um, the long linearity. So it's a long linear form of the Busnaski equations. Um, and also um, an ad hoc scheme was used to um, include the seepage phase as well. What you can see here, um, you know, is, is uh, you know, the water table fluctuations in response to the tide. Um, and on the top, I just plotted uh, a steady state um, solutions um, with the seepage phase neglected. So uh, the coastal boundary is given by the mean sea level, which is, you know, a typical boundary conditions many regional groundwater model would use. Um, uh, for the coastal boundary, for the uh, seaward boundary of the coastal aquifers. Now, <clears throat> the dynamic simulation there, of course, can be easily average over the tidal period. Um, and this is what we see. Um, the, the time average water table um, is, has been elevated. Um, and especially near the shoreline, we see an over height. We see an over high as a result of the propagation of the tide. Of course, um, you know, um, this uh, over high could be due to uh, the long linearities um, in the propagation itself. Um, so this would be uh, described by the long linear Busnaski Bus equations in terms of the um, uh, you know, the wave propagations um, characteristics. 
And the beach slow, which I show you um, before, um, in that moving boundary um, problems, uh, also generate, can also generate um, this time average effect. Um, and seepage phase, of course, um, can contribute to this as well. And in fact, seepage phase um, also induce interactions between um, S2 and M2 in this uh, bichromatic uh, um, oscillation systems to uh, generate this longer period oscillations, spring and neap oscillations. So we, we know the mechanism here, but the question is how this may impact the regional uh, groundwater flow in a coastal aquifer. As I, as I said before, um, you know, we used to just set the mean sea level um, or um, we set the seaward barrier conditions of, according to the mean sea level um, uh, very often in our um, simulations um, of groundwater flows in coastal aquifers. Now, I was involved in a project in Australia. Um, we tried to um, um, quantify uh, this uh, regional groundwater flow systems in what is called uh, the pioneer aquifers um, in northern Queensland. Um, the geology is complex by itself, but the, uh, the point I want to um, draw your attention to um, is about this coastal boundary. Uh, what kind of boundary condition we should um, you know, um, define uh, within this uh, uh, regional groundwater flow models. Um, my colleagues um, working on this model, um, they had to somehow set the groundwater head uh, at the coastline or at the coastal boundary um, to 0.5 meters above the average mean sea levels. They do that in order to match the data uh, of the wood levels from these uh, boreholes uh, near the shorelines. So um, even though this is purely just a, um, a fitting exercise, but clearly um, that has a lot to do with the over height uh, phenomenon uh, uh, and the underlying mechanism I just talked um, about. Um, but my student, um, a student of mine, former student, um, actually um, uh, took um, measurements of um, um, groundwater levels uh, near the shore and a bit away from the shoreline um, in order to uh, quantify the tidal overhead in more details. Um, the model I just show you based on this one deep snask equations um, of course, uh, neglect a lot of um, um, uh, factors um, uh, to do with the uh, geology, to do with uh, uh, the salinities. Um, so um, it is still necessary to have uh, good measurements from the field. And he did that um, just quickly to show you how um, near the shoreline we observe um, relatively high um, water tables, um, uh, elevations um, in the uh, shallow aquifers uh, compare with um, uh, the deep confined systems um, and how that uh, high elevations um, compare with relatively low um, water table elevations further inland. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, it, it, the, the situation is is more complex than uh, uh, you know what could be simply just um, explained by the tidal over height because further inland there is a uh, depression area which could become um, you know a drainage place as well um, so um, it's more complicated but nevertheless the measurement clearly indicate uh, this um, over height effect as a result of the tidal uh, fluctuations uh, and the propagations um, in the aquifer. Now, 
it's a time average effect. And what that mean is um, it could have um, um, an impact um, on the regional groundwater flow. Well, if you look at um, the comparison of the simulations um, with the overheight uh, considers uh, or not, uh, the difference is very obvious there. Uh, we see not only uh, the change of the, uh, uh, the flow, um, um, uh, the, the magnitude of the flow, but also you can see um, um, the flow um, directions, uh, the flow structure uh, has been largely modified um, due to uh, the effect of uh, the tidal overhide. So um, this is quite important. Uh, we have to consider uh, this time average effect as a result of um, the, ocean, um, the, uh, the oceanic oscillations. But 1D um, is, um, approach is definitely inefficient. Um, I said already, um, they are vertical variations in terms of the hydraulic head, in terms of um, the, the salinity, um, in terms of, um, of course, uh, um, um, other um, chemical distributions if we are interested in. So there is a need to resolve the vertical gradings. And that means we have to look at uh, uh, the, the flow and solute transpose um, in that vertical and cross shore 2D sections. Um, the question, of course, um, is uh, how the tide may influence um, the, the 2D um, near shore groundwater flow and solute transport processes. Um, and I'm going to use um, uh, this animation produced by uh, Dr. Claire Robinson. Um, I've been using this uh, to show how tide um, can indeed influence um, um, the near shore groundwater flow and solute transport. The solute, of course, is salt here. Um, and you can see the, the colors um, uh, representing um, the salinity uh, has a very different uh, patterns uh, from uh, what the classical theory predict uh, uh, with just uh, uh, the, uh, the, the formations of the saltwater wedge. Now we see an off saline prune form as well. Now this animation show a fairly dynamic response of the groundwater systems um, to the tide. As the tide rises and falls, we see how um, you know, the flow changes directions, and of course, uh, also the magnitude of the flow as well. Um, it's a little bit, um, it can be very deceiving here, um, even though it, it looks very responsive, the system, um, but the mass transport associated with the flow here is very, very limited. Um, I can tell you that it's not much salt that has been moved um, back and fall um, associated with the change of the flow here. Um, so you must then ask the questions, why then we have um, this off saline prune form? Or maybe you, sh you could also ask the question in a slightly different way. Um, what could be the average time average flow um, showing here um, um, as driven by the tide? Okay, let me first show you um, um, perhaps the, the um, you know the confirmations of the uh, the saline up saline prune. Uh, from the field measurements. Indeed, we measure that, as you can see here, a high salinity um, uh, zone form um, in the upper intertidal zone and fresh water actually discharge between this up saline prune and the saltwater wedge. Um, and this is um, very much consistent with 
the, uh, the numerical simulations um, <coughs> also shown in that previous um, animations. Now, what is um, important though is um, the time average flow. Um, as you can see here, there is a uh, residual um, uh, flow systems um, after we average the tightly driven flow. Um, and it's a circulation uh, system. Um, we can see um, ground, uh, soft water uh, can, uh, continue to flow from the upper part of um, the intertidal zone and exit from um, the lower intertidal zone. Um, this um, this is a this is a persistent flow system, and this persistent flow systems does provide a powerful uh, transport mechanism for salt um, uh, to be transported um, into the aquifers and other chemicals as well, which I will show you shortly. Um, now, I'm not sure if um, if we all know that the wave setup uh, as a result of um, the energy dissipations, wave energy dissipations um, after the wave um, breaks um, in the surf zone. Um, and, and of course, um, it, it produces a radiation stress, which push the sea surface. We're talking about, again, the time average uh, sea surface elevations uh, because of the radiation stress, that mean or average sea surface gets pushed up in the onshore direction. This is called wave setup. Um, now the wave setup produce uh, an onshore um, hydraulic gradients which drive a circulation. And this has been uh, previously studied by Longer Higan, um, and he even provided an analytical solutions to show how uh, a pore water circulation system uh, can be uh, formed uh, under the influence of this wave setup. Now, very similarly, if we look at um, the hydraulic head conditions on the beach surface, um, under the tidal inference, we see this tilting effect, or we see this hydraulic hat gradients um, very much similar to the wave setup um, you know, effect. So um, if, you, if you want to look at uh, this uh, circulation from that point of view, uh, you see um, this um, very similar setup effect um, uh, that also occur uh, in the tidal situations. It can be a lot more complicated. Um, and in fact, this um, phenomenon is very intriguing, very puzzling, and we have not managed to um, explain very clearly what causes it. So what I'm showing here, uh, this is done by um, initially um, another student, but Chen Ji, Chen Ji Sun, um, Dr. Sun looked into this um, um, and, and, and published uh, the phenomenon in AWR uh, in 2009-10. So here you can see, we, we don't have a stable, um, uh, it's not a stable up saline plume as shown before. Let me see if I can, I want to run this um, simulation again. Maybe I'll just go back. I want to show you the animation again. So it's not a stable, um, a single up saline plume. It, 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 um, it, and it's not completely unstable either. Um, it becomes periodic and it forms um, um, 
you know, over a much longer period. I can tell you cycle here, the tidal cycle, right? We're looking at uh, a periodic, uh, you know, formation and then moving down um, offshore um, and merge with uh, the saltwater wedge over a period of roughly 21 tidal cycles. Why 21? Why this very long period? Um, we don't know. Um, you know, it's not something that can be um, explained easily. We, we've been um, looking at how we could develop a theory to explain this. Um, we even look at uh, the hydraulic resonance, um, but there is no way to generate this kind of you know, uh, long period oscillations. We still have not been able to find a good way to explain it. Anyway, so just quickly, um, you know, summarizing, um, let's say what we found in terms of um, the tidal effect um, on the near shore groundwater system. I think there's, a, there's an analogy we can use to help us to understand and appreciate these um, effect of oceanic oscillations. I have not shown you um, some of the results um, um, related to the waves, wave um, events, wave actions. Uh, Pei, Pei Shin, Professor Shin, did quite a bit on that. Um, uh, maybe he will talk about it uh, in the future. Uh, I'll leave that to him. But wave. Um, also impact on um, uh, this near shore groundwater flow systems. And in fact, storm surge, um, which change uh, the wave height over a longer period can also have um, significant uh, impact on this near shore groundwater uh, systems. But I, again, I like to draw your attention to this analogy Astri, it's a nice way of thinking about how um, this um, uh, near shore zone uh, may act as a mixing zone. Um, and of course, um, we're not just talking about salinity here, we're talking about mixing of two very different waters. For example, you could have, um, you know, pH um, variation similar to um, the salinity. Um, and that, again, could influence um, the biogeochemical reactions, which can influence further um, the chemical um, fluxes um, to, um, uh, from the aquifers to uh, the near shore zone. Uh, similarly, of course, uh, oxygen uh, could have a significant uh, impact on the local biogeochemical reactions, uh, and that could change the fate of a lot of reactive uh, chemicals as well prior to the discharge and the subsequent fluxes. I think in the abstract, I mentioned the thermal effect, the temperature um, can also um, um, change the density gradients, we, we know that. Um, and in this case, um, um, we're looking at a warm um, seawaters and how the uh, double diffusions um, might induce um, uh, interesting um, density gradients, um, which um, uh, let to the formations of um, a second um, reversed uh, circulations we call. Um, so uh, I'll let the animation run again. Can you see um, how, um, well, the top panel show uh, the intrusion of the ocean waters um, in terms of the uh, the formations of the salt water wedge. Okay, the low panel show uh, the temperature variations. Okay, as you can see here, because 
um, the diffusivity, the thermal diffusivity is much, much higher than um, the diffusivity of salt, right? Uh, because solids can also uh, conduct the heat, but solute only diffuse in pore water. And you can see as the salt water intrude the aquifer, it loses heat much more quickly, right? So salt water continue to intrude, but it becomes colder. And that in a way provide a resistance to um, the water, to, to, um, to the sea water behind. So you see um, the, um, the gradual um, modifications of the density gradient because of that decoupling or the double diffusions of solute, salinity, and the heat, right? Um, which eventually lead to the flow separations. Um, and, and the formations of the second um, circulations in addition to, uh, well, on the other side of the usual density driven circulations. Um, well, they both density driven, but the other one um, is the one we see in, um, in the classical problems, okay? Now, um, we did a lot more on this and Pei actually um, um, explore how perhaps we can ex explore it, um, the groundwater systems by um, controlling uh, this thermal effect. Um, and he's, he's, he's done some really nice work. But I'm showing um, the effect, this thermal effect, uh, which we, also um, uh, explored in uh, laboratory experiment and found similar uh, circulation systems, uh, very much consistent with the numerical simulation shown here. Now, I, I'm not sure how much time I still have. It's coming to the end. So maybe I should stop here. Um, even though I prepared, um, you know, um, quite a bit um, to cover a research on wetland systems, coastal wetland, but I'm sure um, at some stage, maybe Pei will talk about it. Um, should I stop here? Time is kind of up. Professor Lee, there's no time limitation. Uh, really? We are enjoying <laughs> your talk. Yeah. I like this kind of seminar. <laughs> we can just keep talking. Uh, um, Look, I'll, I'll just quickly show some of these uh, um, uh, results. Um, but then, I don't know if you have a plan to invite uh, Professor Shin to give a talk as well. I don't want to steal his show. Um, but Pei has a lot more to talk about, of course. Uh, I'm yeah, sure. Pei has a lot of wonderful papers. I'm sure he will have more materials to share. <laughs> Okay, so I'll um, quickly um, perhaps go through um, the rest of the presentations. Um, I'll do it more quickly then. Um, of course, um, we know uh, there's also an interesting, um, a very complex uh, uh, groundwater flow systems in coastal wetlands as well. Um, one thing that could be very similar to the beach groundwater system is um, this tidal uh, inference. Uh, as you can see here, um, a vast area of um, the salt marsh undergoes wetting and drying periodically uh, over that tidal cycle. Right? And this um, cycle uh, does something very similar to um, what we have seen um, in, in, in generating uh, circulations, uh, exchange between the marsh soil and coastal water. Um, and you can also look at this problem first 
um, using a very simple 1D um, uh, Busnask equation based um, um, simulations. Uh, very simple. Well, in this case, actually, you could have an analytical solutions. Uh, it's not in a simple form, so you still need to uh, evaluate the sim simulation numerically. Um, I'll quickly show you um, what this uh, will predict. Uh, so basically, we're looking at how the system get joined as the tidal wood level falls below the top of the platform uh, of the marsh. And you can see, of course, the, uh, the drainage takes place, the water table falls, and as the tide rises again, it rises and refill the pool space, but it won't fill the pool space completely, right? It, it drained more, all the water, but it can't fill this completely. And the, the filling of this pore volume occur after the overtopping, right? So very, um, well, that simply just indicate um, this, um, uh, we can say, um, a symmetry uh, of um, uh, filling and draining uh, simply indicate there is a circulation uh, system also. There's a circulating flow um, near the creek uh, form as a result of the tidal inference. So um, a 1D model give you that prediction as well. But um, some measurement were taken by um, Dr. Gate, uh, Baden Gibbs, um, a former student, and um, um, not quite within a salt marsh system, but very much the same in terms of the uh, physical processes I just talked about. Uh, so he measured uh, the circulations near um, a tidal channels uh, in, a, in an intertidal um, sandbanks in Morton Bay. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is um, at the high tide, the low tide, you get exposure of the sandbanks. And well, it's, it, it was really um, a challenging you know, um, uh, task to measure um, what, what is shown here. So he did measure some, um, you know, pore water pressure change over the tidal cycles. But what's shown here is the uh, average um, uh, flow or head gradients. And you can see clearly there's a uh, circulating flow systems um, um, form as a result of the tidal inference. Um, in, in a real marsh system, um, you know, uh, the topography is a lot more complicated. Um, and in fact, typically, um, you know, we, we're talking about a multi-scale um, uh, variations of the topography um, in any marsh systems. Uh, but the, the, the kind of, um, you know, key features um, are related to this incline, uh, fairly milder slopes um, of the system towards uh, um, uh, the, the coastal waters, uh, and then you have a relatively um, steep uh, uh, slopes um, near the creek bank, uh, but also uh, the meanders uh, can uh, represent a change of the morphology or inference the morphologies. And these three features, um, they are of different uh, spatial scales. Um, so to look at how these um, different uh, topographical uh, features may inference um, uh, the, the groundwater flow systems in the marsh soil. Um, Dr. Peixin um, set up this uh, simple but nice models uh, uh, to explore uh, that questions. Um, and, um, it was a long story, but let me give you a short version of it. Uh, basically, 
uh, as you can see here, uh, these circulations uh, in the cross shore directions or cross channel, a uh, cross channel can be seen as uh, cross shore. Um, uh, they both occur. Uh, and in fact, they, they occur um, uh, at different scales as well, or uh, they are inferenced by these um, uh, topographical changes at different scales. Uh, for example, near the shore, we see rapid um, circulating flow systems. Um, in terms of the travel times, uh, they kind of uh, here. Um, um, so relatively short. But then if you um, move away from the creek, um, we see, um, for example, as shown by the particle um, tracking method, um, at this locations, uh, if a particle is released, um, it actually undergoes a flow, a circulating flow um, of a much longer path um, driven more by um, the mild slope or associated with that uh, topographical um, features. And you can see the, uh, that flow um, pathway is a lot uh, lengthier in terms of uh, the physical distance, but also more importantly, um, the travel times. Uh, it's three orders of magnitude almost uh, greater than um, the near shore creek circulations, uh, the near creek uh, circulations. Um, <clears throat> I did have uh, flow instability in the title of my talk, so um, here you see that uh, phenomenon. So um, because of the freshwater input, um, uh, potentially uh, we could have um, an unstable flow system develop uh, when the, uh, um, the salty seawater over, over top the, the marsh and um, the subsequent uh, uh, flow uh, driven by the tidal gradient, but also the density gradients um, can produce these uh, fingering flows. Uh, this is a mixed uh, uh, convection system because in addition to the density gradient, we also have the hydraulic gradient as shown previously um, due to the tide. Uh, and that um, inference, the tidal circulation inference uh, had an impact on the size of um, these fingers, as you can see here, uh, away from the creek, uh, uh, where uh, the circulation is very, very weak. Um, the flow instability um, is, is a, lot in, a lot more intense and you see smaller finger size um, in, in, in the interior. Now, um, it's 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 not just about the flow um, instability and the formation of these fingers. Um, uh, Dr. Sun actually found that um, uh, these unstable flows can produce an exchange of pore water in the marsh interior with surface water, with coastal water, when the overtopping takes place. Um, so there is a there is a, uh, and this is an important transport mechanism, um, and this is an important transport mechanism for exchange between the marsh soil and coastal water. Um, without this unstable flow, the tightly driven circulations is extremely weak in the interior. Uh, I have not shown you uh, the travel time, but um, not for this particular simulation, but from pace simulation, you have seen it, right? So in the interior, uh, this travel time could be three orders of magnitude uh, longer than uh, the near creek circulations. Um, so it's, it's not particularly useful for um, the interior um, in terms of exchange of pore water uh, in the marsh soil with coastal waters. And this unstable flow provide 
um, an alternative, a stronger transport mechanism for that mass exchange. Um, and, and it could be particularly important in a marsh system where um, the creek density is low. So Tenji actually took some real marsh system, I believe, um, to look at how this unstable flow um, um, induced uh, exchange mechanism can play an important role in uh, a low creek density marsh system as shown here uh, in comparison with a more densely distributed um, creek network uh, uh, system. Um, and of course, um, the density gradients and, and the unstable flow um, so um, induced um, can occur not only because of the fresh water input um, uh, or the density contrast between the fresh waters and the, the sea waters, um, salinity um, can accumulate. Uh, the, the, the concentration, the salt concentration can increase uh, due to salt accumulations um, res resulting from evaporations. Um, so um, this is um, also Dr. Sen's work in, in collaboration with Dr. Jan. Um, they looked at um, how evaporations um, may, may lead to accumulation of salt. Um, and this could eventually lead to uh, um, you know, uh, formations of hypersaline zone um, an accumulation of salt on the surface of the marsh um, to uh, uh, to a level um, that salt precipitations will occur. So basically, reaching uh, the saturations of um, the full saturation of salt uh, and and beyond. Um, and, and basically, they managed to predict uh, the formations of salt pan, as shown here. Uh, not only um, this hypersaline zone in terms of pore water salinity, but also the precipitation of salt um, on the surface. Um, and it's it's it, it was the first time this salt pan, um, you know, was simulated. Uh, so they were the first to simulate this uh, salt pan form formations. This was published in WR in 2018. Wow, this system is, uh, I've been talking about, you know, physical processes, but um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an ecological systems and we know plants um, uh, plays an essential role in um, maintaining um, whatever eco uh, services um, um, the system has. Um, so um, plant is, is an important uh, component of that system. And even uh, more interestingly, um, plant of course interact with soil. Um, in terms of um, the growth conditions, we know um, the soil aerations can influence plant growth. Um, and this um, initial work in collaboration with Professor Hailong Lee, um, when he visited us um, at UQ, uh, wow, this date back to um, 2005. So um, we looked at how, um, you know, the tide, um, uh, as, as I talked about, could have a circulation um, you know, generated, uh, but also because of that active circulating systems, uh, as shown in that 1D model, we, we see the drainage. So um, there is an improvement of the aeration conditions. So um, this is um, um, this is needed for plant respirations. Um, so we looked at the, how the tide influenced um, that uh, aeration conditions. And later, Pei looked at this more comprehensively with his um, um, simple uh, creek um, uh, systems. Uh, 
with this uh, uh, three major uh, topographical features. And again, we see um, improved aeration conditions near the, um, the creek. So this um, strip-like um, aeration zone, um, uh, which is also predicted previously uh, by high long in this simple 1D model, uh, sorry, 2D models. Uh, but as you can see here, uh, the mild slope um, in the cross shoot directions also has an impact on the aeration. So the actual changes of the elevations of the marsh platform itself, um, of course, uh, can dictate uh, the aeration conditions. It, the interaction goes um, um, in both ways. Um, we, we just talked about how groundwater flow affect the aeration conditions, which influence the plant growth, but also the plant growth um, can um, influence the groundwater um, systems because of the transpirations. So this is Dr. Pe uh, Dr. Shin's work. Um, he develop developed a couple of models to um, link groundwater dynamics and biomass dynamics plant growth, basically. So here we see um, the inference of um, um, the, the groundwater, um, basically through the saturations um, on uh, the plant growth through this carrying, through changes or modifications of the carrying capacity. Um, and of course, um, in, in return, uh, the plant growth will lead to evaporative transformations as shown here. Uh, this coupled model has produced some interesting result. Um, it's a very uh, busy uh, graph here, but I just want you to focus on one thing. I'll describe it very carefully. So just, um, just look at this. Um, I mean, these oscillation, of course, uh, represent the dynamics, but that's not particularly important. Just um, follow the laser point to see how the saturations decreases over time as a result of the plant growth. Um, so you see a slope here, right? Now, this simply indicates um, the improvement of the aeration conditions as um, the pioneer plant growth uh, at the at the uh, near the near the creek. Uh, this um, you know this positive feedback mechanism is has been um, uh, has been thought to be essential for latest um, plant species to um, to develop in the marsh systems. So the pioneer um, plant um, uh, does some work to improve the saturations uh, and uh, well, uh, the aeration conditions for the later species um, to develop. Um, <clears throat> this, is, um, this is an active system already with the plant um, interactions with groundwater flow. Uh, showing, but um, here is another um, example of how um, biologically or ecologically um, the salt marsh uh, is, is, is an active system, is an interesting system. This coupling of, um, you know, these um, uh, biological um, features, activities with uh, the groundwater flow system is clearly um, quite interesting and it does have an impact uh, in both ways. So here we're looking at um, uh, crab burrows um, uh, as observed um, in the marsh systems on the Chongmin Island. Uh, this was um, uh, Dr. Shen's uh, discoveries. Um, uh, so he found these burrows uh, penetrating through um, a surface um, um, layer of um, self-long 
uh, kind of to reach the, um, um, the you know, this, this um, interface between the two layers, okay? So um, uh, below is a sandy loam um, layers. So, you know, these crab burrows um, can be thought as a uh, preferential flow path. Um, and, and indeed, um, that preferential flow was confirmed uh, by PACE uh, numerical simulations as shown here in terms of the tidally average flow. Of the tidal cycle, of course, we see um, you know, enhanced flow activities um, near uh, the crab burrows. Um, um, uh, but in terms of the net exchange rate, uh, the enhancement um, is quite significant. So, uh, you know, the burrow has led to 70% increase uh, of the net circulation rate for his um, uh, simulations. And the 70% is a lot. Not only um, the, the burrow affect um, the net exchange rate, but also the soil aeration conditions um, gets improved um, as a result of that preferential flow. And of course, here we're talking about preferential drainage as well. And this could help the plant grow. Now, I'm going to um, summarize my talk. Uh, sorry for going over time. Um, this is a bit my personal journey as well, even though um, much of the work was um, in collaboration with uh, colleagues and former students. Um, but, you know, as you could see, um, it, it kind of started from um, almost right after my PhD, I got interested in um, SGD and SGD related research, but my initial interest um, was more um, about um, this global hydrological cycle. Um, and I was inspired by Moore's um, discovery um, and that was published in Nature's 1996. Um, the questions um, we were asking at the time, um, and I think the question uh, still been asked, hasn't really been resolved, um, is how important um, the groundwater flow system or this underground water passage um, may provide um, for terrestrial water to return to the ocean to close this global hydrological cycle. Um, it's important, right? We know this 40,000 cubic meters a year of um, net exchange between the oceans and um, continent um, is largely derived from measurement of major rivers input, groundwater contribution has been more or less assumed to be small. Um, a lot of research has been you know, carried out, um, uh, but of course a question mark can still be put there. Anyway, uh, this was my initial interest um, to, uh, to, to um, uh, that was an interest aiming to close the cycle, uh, but it, it hasn't really uh, gone that far. Uh, but at the time, we um, thought about how potentially the measurements um, using those traces can be complicated by these circulation, um, these circulating flow system driven by tide, but also weight. I had a rather simple um, you know, formula there to combine these different components, but later pay, of course, uh, looked into these things uh, in more details and he questions, um, um, he, he, he seriously questioned his work, uh, put a lot of question marks on uh, our initial uh, simple models, um, this linear uh, superposition um, approach. 
So there are a lot of coupling effect between these different forcing, um, um, well, between these different components uh, driven by different forces. Um, and, and for that reason, I guess we uh, looked into, um, you know, the local flow processes in a lot more detail, but in terms of um, the implications and the purpose of doing this more detailed research um, had a lot to do with um, uh, SGD contributions to local uh, coastal, um, to, to the problems we face um, uh, in these local um, coastal ecosystems. Uh, for example, I was involved um, um, in research um, aiming to uh, determine um, how uh, Ferris Iron could um, get into the bay, Morton Bay near Brisbane to trigger Limbia bloom. So the question we um, we were asking um, was um, whether the SGD provide a subsurface transfer pathway for uh, important chemical to uh, coastal waters to trigger a lot of these ecological problems. And particularly, we were interested in the tidal effect on these chemical um, transformations prior to the discharge and the subsequent fluxes. And now I think, you know, going um, through this global to local, um, and we, we, we're coming back to consider some um, global problems again, um, uh, especially in collaborations uh, with Dr. Shogang Chen and, and Isaac um, Santos, um, Professor Santos, um, we, um, we, we want to, um, quantify the carbon fluxes um, associated with the poor water exchange between uh, salt marshes and coastal waters. Um, and from the initial measurements Shogun um, um, carried out um, in Australia and also in China, uh, it does show um, important um, exchange or export of carbon fluxes uh, to the oceans from these marsh systems. And um, the amount is very comparable to uh, the carbon burial. So, um, you know, uh, that does raise the questions whether we have underestimated the carbon sinks of these uh, blue carbon store. Okay, um, I think this is my, yeah, that was my last slide. Um, I like to um, acknowledge my, um, um, collaborations with colleagues um, listed there. Um, I, uh, you know, uh, have benefited a lot from working with these guys. Um, many of them already mentions. Uh, just before I um, open <laughs> for the questions, can I do a quick advertisement? I haven't, I forgot to ask for your permissions uh, for Tom, but um, do we have so any? No <laughs> well, Westlake, <laughs> I'll run a very quick um, advertisement um, for my university now. Um, this is a very new, a brand new, really, um, university. So, um, um, do we have any foreign co colleagues here? Um, I haven't checked the, the audience list. Um, anyway, um, it's a very young, very internationalized university, very supportive. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure I have mentioned to many of you, uh, we try to hire the best people. Um, and we give them the best support as well to achieve, to achieve their goals, um, very high goals. And if I quote uh, our president, um, he's saying that uh, there's no limit, sky is our limit. So um, that's our ambitions and uh, uh, the university indeed is developing quite well. Um, now, some of you have already visited us, um, 
I'm showing a photo here. Um, it's very small, so you probably can't see very well, but I can tell you this is me. This was me. And I was sitting next to Professor Billy Moore, and he visited us twice. Um, not sure if he's in the audience, um, but you know, even though I have not collaborated with um, Professor Moore on any published work, but we wanted to work together and we appreciate um, his visit. Uh, during his visit, he helped us to set up um, the lab and it was uh, really great. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, uh, as the countries open up again, right, we have no controls, uh, no border control, um, we can start to uh, travel. Um, and of course, we can still to host uh, people, um, people's visit. So you are all very warmly welcome to visit us. Um, um, and also, um, we we are hiring people uh, for PhD places, uh, for postdoc research fellows uh, positions, uh, and of course uh, faculty positions as well. Um, if you are interested in any of these positions, uh, please contact me. You can scan this uh, code here to um, to find more information about these positions. Um, but do contact me if you are interested um, um, in any of these positions. Um, one thing I can tell you is that um, for our foreign colleagues, uh, I'm not sure if there are any in the audience, um, this, uh, this university is located in Hangzhou. Um, this is pretty much the best part of uh, China. So, uh, well, Charles would agree <laughs> to me <laughs> with me on that. Um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, this is something important as well. Um, on campus, we have nice cafes um, that serve excellent coffee. So, um, you know, I had no problem. Um, uh, over the transition period uh, after I moved back to China uh, from UQ, um, coffee uh, kept me quite happy <laughs> over that period. Um, of course, um, I didn't have, uh, as usual, the opportunity to copy with my um, my uh, former student, Chen Min. We used to go to copy very often. I see Chen Min online as well. Um, but tell you, this uh, place is great. Good coffee. Chime in if you come. Um, we could coffee every day. <laughs> okay, with that, um, thank you very much. Uh, thank, um, thank you, everyone, for um, uh, coming to listen to my talk. And I'm really sorry for running over time a lot. Um, but quite happy now to answer your questions. Um, if it's too late, you, we can, you know, um, uh, also interact afterwards. Um, I have my email uh, written down there. Uh, and also WeChat ID. Okay. Thanks, Professor, Professor Xu, Lee. Sorry. <clears throat> Thanks. Very, very great talk. So um, any questions from the audience? You can just uh, turn, on, turn around your uh, microphone and the, and the talk. Yeah, I, I indeed invite, invited uh, Billy Moore uh, to attend our uh, seminar, but he's not a fan of a Zoom meeting. He said he, yeah. he, he do not like to do an online seminar. He wants to meet face to face <laughs> he said that <laughs> yeah we should invite him back <laughs> well I, I i you know uh, i think we all uh, suffer from this um uh very tight control border control um pretty much for the last three years right um not only our visitors uh, international visitors um 
couldn't come. We couldn't, um, you know, visit them either. So it's been extremely inconvenient. But hopefully now, um, you know, we 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 can start to travel. Yeah. So uh, before I, I told my students, um, you know, if they if if they want, they can all uh, go to um, Vienna for the AGU meetings. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pay for them. <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> Pay, do you have any questions? No. No, you just love chats. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how are you I doing? Just, uh, show you hey, guys. I'm still so here. Oh, Beach, please. Do you have questions? Hello, uh, a nice talk. And uh, I think this uh, is really a different aspect of uh, the groundwater. Uh, I just want to uh, comment on, on your uh, earlier work on the oceanic oscillation on the beach face, uh, because uh, we set up a few monitoring wells uh, at our uh, Dongshan Shuer Marine Station. And uh, actually, uh, um, that's um, not a really surface aquifer. Um, it's um, more like a, a crackered fractures uh, okay. in, in basement rocks. Uh, so, but we still monitored uh, very similar signals of the water table oscillation uh, uh -huh. consistent with the uh, tidal signals. So uh, I, um, I wonder maybe the, the similar uh, equations will govern also in our case. So it's good to see these equations. Uh, yeah. They give some clue to explain our signals. Now, um, the fracture system is um, is and can be uh, very very complicated. Um, of course, um, you know we um, we do have um, let's say um, equivalent porous medium models for these uh, fracture systems, um, mm -hmm. but. It, it depends on, you know, um, um, the system itself. And of course, questions asked about the systems. These equivalent force medium models um, uh, often um, work for, let's say, flow um, reasonably well, but not so much for um, the solute transports or chemical reactions, that would be even worse. Um, now, I had a student um, who worked on how we may develop an equivalent porous medium models for uh, a fracture systems. Um, and, and that work was based on uh, indeed direct simulations of discrete flow through discrete network um, and um, and used the uh, percolation theory to look at the connectivities of um, the system. Okay, so um, uh, um, a discrete network um, have interesting percolating properties, um, uh, properties that could follow power law near the critical conditions, but property can be very much scale dependent as well. Okay, when I say property, I'm talking about equivalent porous medium properties, um, such as um, hydraulic conductivities and equivalent mm -hmm. hydraulic conductivity, for example, right? Um, mm -hmm. But if we, um, you know, if, if, if we can derive this kind of equivalent porous medium models, um, then, of course, um, the governing equations I show and the analytical solution, um, uh, you know, derived for these equations, they may be applicable. Um, so, hey, actually, I need to have a chat with you about uh, your um, perhaps monitoring program at the same side or maybe another side. Um, in relation to this thermal effect I mentioned, but how the temperature difference 
could um, modify um, the local geochemical reaction conditions and um, the chemical fluxes. So I have a PhD student who's doing that, um, that research. And, and uh, and we, okay. um, um, well, Gui Yuan mentioned that you've been monitoring um, a side uh, with fairly good consideration of the temperature effect. So we thought maybe yeah. we can team up to uh, look at your um, data um, and ha have some preliminary uh, investigation. And if needed, we can carry out further monitoring at the same site. So um, sure. if you have time, if you have time uh, so maybe sometime this week, we can um, we can have an online meeting to discuss this. Okay, yeah, we have some, uh, we have data things 2019. Okay. So it's continuous uh, temperature oh, and okay. conductivity on water table. So. Okay, but also yeah. um, measurements are a lot of uh, chemical compounds, right? Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a signal, oh, okay. and now we we are carrying out a monthly um, investigation of these chemicals. Okay, it would be good to have a chat. In fact, um, Xuan um, checked out your website, maybe, and she found some information about the site and also the monitoring program. Yeah, we yes. can discuss uh, further. Yeah, we're okay. going to discuss yeah. further, and also we can maybe have further discussions on um, the other systems, the fracture systems, and mm -hmm. your monitoring as well. Yeah, now we have more wells set up, so we are okay. going to have more data. <laughs> okay. What's all? I just have a su suggestion. Hey, come in. I, I think we need to, uh, in the coming New Year, we can organize. Uh, uh something like workshop so we can discuss in person you know <laughs> we could do that I mean, we should do yeah. that um you know maybe uh, let, I, let, let uh, like, like, like meet uh, professor more uh, i also history. prefer face-to-face -face meetings um online meetings you don't see the audience and it, it's it's a little bit um you know uh Weird to talk to the screen, even though I, you know, I can see uh, Paul Chow. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, we can we can go to West Lake. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's good. I'm quite happy to host the workshop as Pei suggested um, in Hangzhou at West Lake. We have moved to our new campus. It's really uh, wow. It looks nice, but we we have a lot of complaint about the problems, uh, the quality. The details. Um, yeah, because Andrew Barry likes to visit uh, us uh, in spring. Right? You know, he emailed me uh, last week. He liked to visit us in this uh, spring. Maybe we can also get some international friends here. Yeah, we. I mean, perhaps Boto can um, set up. An organizing committee. We can we can do a workshop. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's oh, a... hey, 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 you uh, want to set up a, a committee? Um, yeah, that's a have, uh, I'm a bit busy. I'm a bit busy now. We, you can <laughs> we, you have a assistant a research assistant. You know. Oh, when I say um, we set up an organizing committee, I'm quite happy to provide support as well. <laughs> yeah, so then I'll be honored to visit West Lake and the best of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> so we can do that. I mean, I'm quite happy to host a, a workshop on this. And Chemin has been doing very interesting work with his student. Um, I mean, I, I have not been, um, you know, responding uh, properly, but, you know, I, I went over these papers you sent. They're really good, good, very good uh, work. Thanks, Neil. 
I watch and I read you. And, um, and it would be interesting to hear you um, uh, hear you talk about you know the work. Um, thanks. Recent, uh, thanks. Too late in Australia. Hey. 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 <laughs> well, Hello, um, there's you? one thing that I would like to share. Um, I um, besides the technical aspect of what Ling has been discussed in the presentation. Um, I'm so glad that I'm one of the person who also witnessed how this individual work um, was being done um, pieces by pieces. And it's like actually a nostalgic processes that, that reminds what happens 15 years ago, later on tens, five years and, and, and now, and we have all more opportunities to come up to work together. And it's so exciting. So, you know, somehow longevity gives another angle of review and that's basically my feeling <laughs> i would like to share yeah, yeah, that's, Come that's, a, <clears throat> yeah that's a great chair and um uh, Billy, you, know, I, you, I, shave, uh, <laughs> you grow in your mustache <laughs> <laughs> mustache <laughs> yeah. okay maybe we should um meet um at another time to talk about this workshop and yeah and have Believe. a and have a gathering um at westlake university i'm quite happy to host a you know a workshop looking okay. forward happy okay. new year okay <laughs> thanks again happy professor new lee year. thanks everyone yeah okay all right bye, -bye. thanks bye. for hosting it for bye. Bye. really appreciate it thanks link for thanks. the great presentation bye bye see you bye bye, bye. bye see you everyone <laughs>